We've seen how we might implement a stack using an array as the mechanism for storage. What about a queue? And once again, we're going to have our requirement that everything has to be order one. So we have an array that we're storing things. In the stack, all we needed was to keep track of the top of the stack. And in some ways, this you know, makes sense. The bottom of a stack is basically defined by whatever it's stacked upon. Uh, so it, it doesn't move. But in the case of a queue, we have to keep track of both a back and a front, okay, where new items will be added and where items will come off. In fact, in looking at this, these labels might be backwards of where I want them. We'll see in just a second. Okay, so this would be an empty queue. I have a back, a front. Once again, they're integers, but I'm representing them here as arrows to make it more pictorially uh, significant to you. And the queue is empty. Okay. So something is put on the queue. We call in queue. Once again, to make it easy to type, I'm just going to go with integers. So I in queue a five. Well, as we all learned early in school, you get in line at the back of the line. So it goes in at the location of back. That is no longer the back of the line anymore because the next element should go someplace else. So just like I kept top in the location where the next element was going to be added, I'm going to do the same thing with back. Back is always going to point to the location where the next element should be added and front is going to point to the location where the next element should be removed. We'll see that in just a second. So I in queue something else. Maybe I put a three. And then the back moves over again. One more time. Let's do a four. And the back moves over. Okay, that's all fun. What about when we dequeue? Well, when I dequeue, this five has to be returned because it's at the front. And that will no longer be the front. The thing that should be dequeued next should be the three. Here's the thing. It is tempting to copy the three and the four down. Okay? But that would be an order in operation. If I had a million things on this queue and dequeuing the first one caused me to copy all of them, clearly that would be inefficient. So I'm not allowed to copy everything down. When I pull this off, what I instead have to do is update front to move to the next item in line. Sounds simple enough. We'll dequeue again. The three comes off and that's now the front. Let's keep this going. Let's enqueue something. A nine and the back moves to here. Let's enqueue again. A one and the back moves to here. Now I want to enqueue one more thing. So let's say I enqueue a two. Where does back go? And if I were following our trend so far, back would come here, but that's not a valid location in the array. Instead, to keep this efficient, we make this a circular queue. Once you go off the end, you move back to the beginning. And this happens for both back and front. If we kept dequeuing all the way until front passed off the end, it would move back to the beginning. This way I can enqueue and dequeue to my heart's content as long as I don't actually fill up the queue, I will never allocate more memory. All I do is I change the ints around. Okay, so this should give us an, implement, uh, an efficient implementation to work with. Now we can start putting it in code. So let's go ahead and let's make our new class for array queue. As before, it is going to extend the queue that we made previously. So it needs to take a type parameter for A and it's going to extend the queue for that. I'm going to remove the comments because basically the contract is specified in the trait that is the super type. And now we need to implement these. Okay. We also, we need our data. So private var, we're going to have the store of our data, which is the array. I'm gonna start off with 10 again. Now you might recall we cannot make arrays unless we 
provide this extra information. So I'm going to put a restrict or say that we have to have a class tag here. And then I also need, instead of just a top, I need a front, which starts at zero. And I need a back, which starts at zero. And I'm missing the bar. So is empty. As before, I like to start with the easy methods. When is this empty? For our stack, it was when the top was at zero. That's not the case here. What was what did we start off with? Well, we started off where back and front both pointed to zero. And in general, so if we had added one thing, back would have moved over. And then if we had removed, front would have moved over. So we would have been empty again, and the two would have pointed to the same location. So that's our condition for emptiness. When front equals back. What about peak? Well, peak should just give you the next thing that would come off, which would be the item at the front of the queue. So data sub front. DQ should return that to us and wrap around. So this one's a little bit longer. And we are going to bring in a temporary variable here. Actually, I'll call it ret because it's my return value. And that is data subfront. And at the end, I have to give that back. In between those two, I need to move front forward. Now, it's easy enough to say that I could do front plus equals one, but that's not sufficient for the wrapping. So I could do this in two lines. I could say front plus equals one if front is greater than or equal to data dot length, then front equals zero. That would do it. I actually don't normally do it this way, uh, in part because I can write it in a way that's a little bit simpler and it works well if we need to use these things as, as an expression. If I need to check is the next element going to be in a position that, that I need to do something for, it's really hard to have these two lines in doing that for me. Instead, this is a great place where you can use the modulus operation. So I'm going to say front is equal to front plus one mod data dot length. This does, for our purposes, the same thing because the modulo, remember, is remainder after division. So it can never get up to data dot length. If front plus one is data dot length, then when you take the mod, you get zero. So it will wrap back around down to zero. So this does the wrapping and it does this nicely in a single expression for us. And that winds up being significant for our queue when we in queue. So in queue, at least the easy part of in queue, is I want to uh, at store value at back and increment back. Okay, so data sub back equals what we passed in and then back equals and I'm going to use the same modulo here back plus one modulo data dot length of course as we saw in our stack there is the possibility where we would fill this up and this is actually it's this if here that where the modulo comes in handy because it turns out that, so in the stack, I was able to literally fill every single slot and then grow on the next one. It was the, the push after I had filled every slot that did the grow. For the queue, that won't work. And to understand why, imagine that I allow myself to enqueue two more things. So I'm going to enqueue a 7, and then this moves to here, and now I'm going to enqueue a 10. Well, if I were just to allow this to happen, this would be my picture right here. But remember, when back equals front, that's our condition for empty. Okay, so this is a queue that says that it's empty. Clearly, I can't allow that. So that means that at this point here, when they go to enqueue the 10, we have to actually grow the array right now and not wait until the point. So if the grow would cause back to move on top of front, so that's our, our if. If the new version, if the new value of back, but the new value of back has to potentially wrap. 
And this is where if I had done back plus equals one and then an if, it would be hard to do uh, in because I have to embed that inside of an, an if. It's not impossible, but, but it's more challenging. Uh, the modulo makes this easy. Well, then we can do something very similar to what we did with the stack. Actually, if, but I can't copy this. Well, I can, cop I can copy it, but parts of it aren't going to work. So, to see why. So I create a new array. I'm going to double the length for the same reasons we did before, because the amortized cost. But I can't just do a copy. Once again, let's look at our picture. If I just did a copy here, I would have a bigger array, but it would have a whole bunch of blanks over here. And it still would look like on the ad, it was empty. So I actually need to shift things around. And to do this, and you can choose to do it in many ways, what I do is I uniformly move the front to be up at zero. So when I create this large array, I'm gonna copy the four to the zero, the nine to the one, the one to the two, and fill things in that way, and that way I have all my blanks at the end. Okay, and that I can't do with array.copy, I'm going to need a for loop. So I'm going to do for i in, let's say, zero until data.length minus one because I only have, I don't have quite as many elements as there are uh, positions in the current queue. Temp sub i equals data sub, and here again my modulo comes in handy. It's going to be i plus front, or if you want you could think of it as front plus i because we are pulling in wherever front is plus the i. We're copying that down to i. And we have to make sure that we do our wrapping. So front plus i modulo data dot length. If we don't do the modulo and front is bigger than zero, this will wind up going out of bounds on our array. So that does the copy over. This changes the data. But when we do this, we also have to move around our front and back. When we're done with this, we've always made it so the front is at zero and the back is at data.length minus one. And then once we've done that, we will copy in the value, which goes to back. It goes to the position at length minus one and then this gets incremented and back will be at data.length. So there's our queue, at least a stab at it. Uh, we're gonna come back, we're gonna talk about testing and we're gonna make sure that this and our stack actually work and do what we want them to.